Chris Litterland. I'm one of the co-directors and co-founders of HEC, the study for the uh, Center for the Study of Human Evolution, Cognition, and Culture. And this is one of the uh, lectures that we're funding along with primary funders, along with Green College and HESP at SFU and many other uh, units at uh, UBC and <coughs> SFU. So we'd like to thank all the people who contributed to both <coughs> tonight's lecture and the other lectures in this cluster we've been uh, putting together this week. Now, the reason we put together this lecture cluster is to inaugurate a, a new initiative at HEC, which is CERC. We like catch uh, acronyms. Uh, Cultural Evolution of Religion Research Consortium, which is the result of a large grant we just got from the Canadian government to fund a six-year program to study the, uh, the evolutionary origins of religions and the role that religion plays in human prosociality uh, and the rise of human civilization. So it's a very exciting project. Um, please check out our website. We'll be holding public events like this. We'll have large lectures, but we'll also be keeping people up to date on our research outputs um, and our recent findings. So please check back to the CERC website to find out about where religion comes from. <laughs> Um, so, <clears throat> we're very happy to be able to inaugurate this, this lecture cluster with David Sloan Wilson. Uh, David is SUNY Distinguished Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University in New York. And he's probably best known for his work as an evolutionary theorist. So, uh, for the, the, those dark decades where uh, gene-only selection was the dominant ideology, he was, uh, he was the lone voice in the wilderness saying, no, there's, there's other ways to look at evolution. Uh, multi-level selection makes sense, and he he, he has prevailed. Uh, I think that the, the nowadays it's not the controversy is not over, but the dominant view now I think is that we need to look at the evolution at different levels of selection, genes, individuals, and groups. Um, and I think this is due in no small part to David's efforts. So uh, if you want to know a little bit about evolutionary theory and a little bit about the background of the controversy, one of David's recent works is Evolution for Everyone in 2007, which is a great intro, just uh, primer on evolutionary theory, uh, histories of the debates about it, and also how it applies to everyday life. If you're interested in the religion angle, uh, David was <coughs> the author in 2002 of Darwin's Cathedral, which is one of the pioneering efforts to take uh, very old theories and the humanities about the role of religion in creating groups and using ritual to bring people together, but uh, reframe it in terms of a scientifically viable theory, uh, uh, group cultural evolution. So uh, that's been a great inspiration for us, which is a, a, one of the reasons we're very thrilled to have him come out and, and help us kick off our new project. So tonight he'll be talking about one of his newer projects, which is uh, essentially how evolutionary theory can help us restructure or structure more intelligently our civic and social lives. So a lot of uh, policy making gets done, a lot of ideas about how to get people to stop doing X and start doing Y, decisions about this get done, uh, it, kind of flying blind. And, and David's argument is if you, uh, evolution is the key to understanding how people get together in groups, how people function. And if you use evolutionary theory and apply it to uh, contemporary life, it'll, it'll give you some insights that are actually very useful. So tonight he'll be speaking to us on using evolution to improve the quality of everyday life. So please uh, help me welcome David Sloan Wilson. Thank you for coming out. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Great, okay, so let's get the guys started. Um, I, uh, I want to begin by talking about three waves of evolutionary thought. The first is the one we all know about, a theory that is, uh, organizes the biological sciences. The second is a theory that can organize the study of our own species, and I think Ted is addressing that, that when we use evolution to study a topic such as religion, or any other human-related topic. That is both old and new. Of course, Darwin was interested in all things human, and at the time, one reason that evolution was so revolutionary is that everyone knew that if true, it would have profound consequences for the way we think about ourselves. And yet, for complex reasons, evolution became stigmatized for the study of humans for most of the 20th century, and didn't really renew itself until late in the 20th century. It wasn't until the late 1980s and the 1990s that people really began to try to rethink the human-related disciplines, both the human sciences and the humanities, from 
an evolutionary perspective. And so the fact that we're studying religion from an evolutionary perspective, or literature from, an, or not, not to speak of psychology and anthropology, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, is both old and new. Um, and then the third wave is a theory that can be used to improve the quality of everyday life. And that is still more new, in part because of a very complex and turbulent history in the application of evolution to public policy in the past, what became known as social Darwinism, which of course was terribly um, uh, problematic. So I've been involved in the third wave for about um, uh, five years. In uh, 2006, I started something called the Binghamton Neighborhood Project. I started using my city as a field site for evolutionary research, including applied evolutionary research. So basically trying to improve the quality of life in my own city of Binghamton, New York. And a year later, I helped to found the Evolution Institute, which is the first think tank for formulating public policy from an evolutionary perspective, a, a think tank in general terms, not, not tied to any specific location. Um, <coughs> and so I have been involved in applying evolution to everyday life uh, for um, a, a good long time now. It gives me a sense of, uh, of, uh, of what's going on. And here's what all three waves share uh, in common. It's not as if evolutionary theory provides all the answers. What it does do is provide a way of organizing information and guiding the search for new information that is exceptionally powerful. And in this capacity, it proves its worth from the very beginning. When you go back and you think about Darwin and Wallace, the first people to discover the concept of natural selection and evolution, and how it caused them to think about the natural world. It caused them to organize information and to search for new information in a new way from the very, very beginning. And when you talk to people today who are studying human-related subjects from an evolutionary perspective, and you ask them, you know, what is it about evolution that, that's useful for you? you know, typically these people were, were trained in some human-related discipline, and then they encounter evolution, and they find this to be so very insightful. What they typically say is, is before, I might have been a social psychologist, for example, and of course I liked my discipline, but it was just like a bunch of disconnected topics. <coughs> and what evolution helps me to do is to actually put these topics together in a new way and to organize the search for, um, for uh, new information and also to integrate across um, disciplines. And so, of course, this has been true in my own experience. How is it possible for someone such as myself to study a topic like religion and contribute anything at all to a topic which has received so much study and so much scholarship over the decades? What would I add to that topic other than a new way of organizing that information? And when I started to study public policy issues from an evolutionary perspective, it was a very uh, suspenseful question on my part. If I'm going to study education or, or between group conflict or economics from an evolutionary perspective, and these topics, of course, they've been considered by the brightest people from so many perspectives for so long. Is it really true that, that this new perspective could add value to what's come before? And, and the answer is yes. And so I, if there's a single take-home message to this talk, it is that when you approach policy issues from an evolutionary perspective, it proves its worth from the very beginning. And, and uh, so that is my, my single uh, take-home message. Uh, evolutionary science provides a powerful toolkit for the formulation of public policy, begins to prove its worth immediately, just as in the biological sciences and the academic study of humans. And, uh, and also, policies derived from an evolutionary perspective are no more or less ethically problematic than policies derived from any other perspective. For any policy issue, there's a bunch of people sitting around at the table. We're trying to find out what works. There's ethical issues involved. And an idea that's derived from an evolutionary perspective is simply going to be evaluated by the same criteria as policies derived from any other, um, any other perspective. And in this talk, I want to illustrate this bottom line with two examples. So I'm going to talk about one of our projects called ProSocial, which is a framework for increasing the efficacy of groups of all sorts. 
I claim that we could actually make groups work better, no matter what those groups might be. And then the second example is to rethink economics. So two small topics for today, those two. <laughs> and you norm normally when I give talks, I feel the need to present a lot of background information before I get to what I really want to uh, talk about. And today I've decided actually not to provide so much background information, but to immediately get to the ideas that I want to uh, talk about. And so if you are, feel like you need more background information, I would encourage you to do two things. First of all, read all of my books. And then the, but the second, is, the second is, is to get in touch with what the folks at HEC and CERT are doing. Because here in the, in the Vancouver area, both at SFU and at UBC, there's tremendous talent individuals that are doing this sort of thing. And, and so basically, you have the means, if you haven't already, to learn about what's been happening, about evolution in relation to human affairs, both in the academic sense and increasingly in the, in the um, applied sense. So I very much encourage you to just find out what's, what's available intellectually in your own backyard, basically, um, on these, um, on these, um, on these uh, topics. Okay, so nearly everything important requires working in groups. It's hard for me to think of anything that doesn't involve working in groups. And even things that we think of as individuals, for example, our personalities, involve actually social interactions taking place throughout our development. And in an individualistic culture, when we, when we invest so much and we think so much in terms of individual agency. Actually, we need to step back and we need to realize that almost everything worth doing is done in groups of people. And another obvious point is that policy implementation by definition requires cultural change. We're trying to change the way we do things at a number, any number of levels, from an individual in a therapeutic context to small groups, all the way to uh, worldwide scale, such as, um, such as um, uh, climate change. And evolutionary theory has much to say about both of these things. Throughout my career as a biologist, I have studied how can social groups evolve to be adaptive units? How can basically doing things that are for the good of the group be favored by the process of natural selection? And increasingly, culture, which seems to set us apart from other species, is being viewed from an evolutionary perspective. That, we are, that our capacity for culture and our flexibility as individuals and groups is actually a product of genetic evolution. And it's an evolutionary process in its own right. So culture from an evolutionary perspective is basically what this is all about. And some of the most recent work has been, has been done. So my point is, is that evolutionary theory has a lot to say about making groups work and changing cultural uh, practices. That's what we're bringing to the policy uh, table. But other branches of the human-related disciplines also have much to say about these topics. I'm not here to say that the human-related sciences have nothing to offer. Quite the contrary. If you consult fields such as political science, um, um, the applied behavioral sciences, uh, a field called prevention science that most hardly anyone has heard about, sciences such as uh, business practices, including cooperative business practices, what you find is, is that in these disciplines there are some very successful practices that have been derived, things that work. And so we need to know about those, but the problem is, is that these disciplines are not integrated either with each other or with evolutionary <coughs> theory. So we have this terrible problem of isolation, all of these things uh, emerging in different disciplines, but very little integration with each other or with evolutionary theory. And so the objective of our pro-social project is to integrate all of these insights that have come from different disciplines um, into a single theoretical framework, and then to use that framework in a practical sense to improve the efficacy of real world groups to coordinate groups with each other, to make it possible for groups to talk to each other, and also create a scientific database out of these groups so that we can study them and, um, and then increase our own ability to increase the efficacy 
of our group. So let me introduce you to some of my partners in this enterprise. This is Eleanor Ostrom, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in uh, Economics in 2009 and very sadly passed away earlier this year. Why didn't she win the Nobel Prize? Um, for showing that groups of people, especially groups of people that manage their common resources, are capable of managing their common resources on their own. Okay. Economic wisdom held that when there's, when, the, when there's a common resource, then there's a tragedy of over-exploitation called the tragedy of the commons. And economic wisdom held that this tragedy will occur unless you can either privatize the resource so that people just manage their own resource for their own benefit, or otherwise, if that can't be done, would require sort of top-down management. And what Ostrom did with her associates was she actually studied groups of people attempting to manage their common pool resources, such as farmers creating irrigation systems, fishermen managing their fisheries, people relying on forest pro uh, products, pastors, and all of these cases, you have groups of people with a common resource. And what she discovered is, is that they were capable of managing their affairs, thank you very much, but only when certain conditions were met. It was not as if each and every group managed their own affairs. They varied, and she was able to derive the ingredients that caused some, work, some groups to work well and other groups to work poorly. And so she derived eight design principles that help groups to work, and I'm going to share these principles with you. And if you are uh, knowledgeable about evolution, then you will see that these principles, which Ostrom derived from the field of political science, are very consilient with the evolutionary dynamics of cooperation in any species and the history of our species, the evolution of our species as a highly cooperative uh, species. So here are the eight ingredients that Ostrom um, they're out. How to make groups work. The groups that worked well had a strong group identity and purpose. They knew that they were a group and they knew what they were about. It was a proportional equivalent of cost and benefits. It was not the case that most people did most of the work and other people got the benefits. Either those things were shared equally or if somebody did most of the work, then they got proportionally, they got um, the benefits. There was consensus decision making. People hate being bossed around, but they'll work very hard to do something that they decide to do by uh, consensus or by another decision making process that they regard as uh, fair. In most groups, most individuals are happy to cooperate, but a few are not. And unless you can monitor good behavior, then bad behavior will uh, tend to occur. When bad behavior does occur, then there has to be something that you do about it and it should start out gradual. And so in the groups that worked, if somebody misbehaves, a friendly, gentle reminder was usually sufficient, and yet it's also important to escalate in those cases where somebody still refuses to um, play by the rules. Uh, there will be conflict within groups, and that conflict has to be resolved in a matter that's fast and fair. Finally, when a group is nested within other groups, then, there, then the group has to have enough elbow room, enough authority, and basically the ability to manage its own affairs enough so that they can do these things. But if what they do is dictated by outside the system, then all bets are off with respect to one through six. And finally, in a multi-group population, then we have, to, we have to figure out the relationships among the groups that more or less embody the same principles as the relationships among individuals within the groups. And that's a concept that Ostrom calls polycentric governance. Such a simple idea, but actually quite revolutionary, that every sphere of activities, in the first place, in modern, in, in anyone's life, there's many spheres of activities, many things we must do. And every sphere of activity has an appropriate scale. Some things are best done as an individual, some things are best done as small groups. Some things are best done as large groups. And the only way that we can govern our affairs in a large sense is to find the optimal scale for each and every sphere of activities and then coordinate those spheres of activities. And anything else will be suboptimal. Isn't that simple? Very intuitive. And yet, of course, it's not at all the way everyone thinks um, about it. 
Well, here's three other gentlemen, Attorney Biglin, Dennis Embry, and Steve Hayes, who represent the um, fields of prevention science and, uh, and behavioral cognitive and mindfulness-based therapies. Steve Hayes is actually quite famous as the founder of a therapeutic method called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, ACT. And, um, um, and this is sometimes called a third wave therapy, uh, which a behavior, behavioral therapy was the first wave, cognitive therapy was the second wave, and then there's a form of mindfulness-based therapies, which actually is convergent with many religious meditational practices, which adds value to uh, cognitive and behavior um, uh, therapy. And, uh, and prevention science is basically a blend of the behavior tradition that, uh, that uh, is represented by uh, 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 this third wave therapy and public health so that you can apply some of these principles at the, at the level of not changing, not, not basically providing therapy for people that really need help at the individual level, but for changing the practices of groups and even the practices of large populations using the same uh, principles. Now, actually, when many people think of therapy, they think of Freud and, and kind of, you know, hocus pocus stuff that takes forever and doesn't work. And um, actually, my mother underwent therapy for her whole life. And my stepfather was a crusty surgeon who I loved. And he said that uh, this therapy just cost a fortune, and all it did was cause my mother to become less inhibited about saying the word fuck was the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> the only benefit of this uh, of therapy. But mindfulness, but this, uh, this but this, uh, this, uh, uh, these other therapeutic methods, this is, this is excellent science, and it's, and it's very much evidence-based. So these guys approach it very, very, um, uh, scientifically. And the assessment and the validation of these methods is something that you can only admire once you read these, these, these studies. I actually want to share this with you. I'm not talking about evolution yet. I'm talking about some of these traditions that have, that have, uh, that have developed mostly without reference to evolution, and yet they're very successful in their own, uh, in their own uh, way. So when we look at individual change, this is a trial with um, uh, patients who go to hospitals because they're suffering from psychotic symptoms and they're terrible because they're terrified because they have all these hallucinations they don't know what's going on they check themselves into a hospital and a three-hour intervention using acceptance and commitment therapy um, um, has the rate of hospital readmission a three-hour intervention so what's going on here but basically what acceptance and commitment therapy is doing is it's getting, is trying to increase your behavioral flexibility by causing you to be mindful about your true values. So it will go something like this. Okay, you're suffering these hallucinations, and of course so you're, you, that's, that's all you can think about. What would it be like if actually you were to continue to have these hallucinations? What are, the, what are you really trying to accomplish in life, and might you be able to accomplish this despite the fact that this problem might not go away? And thinking about it in this way causes you to become less terrified about the problem that you have, and also to obsess about it less. And actually, the problem might not go away because you're not focusing on it so much. And so the whole strategy of acceptance and commitment therapy is in the first place to increase, flex increase behavioral flexibility so that your repertoire of behaviors that you're considering increases. And then to be mindful about your true values so that you can actually select the behaviors that are really going to help you move forward with your life. Now, I didn't use the word evolution, but I did use the word variation and selection. It's a little bit of a behavioral tie-in right there. And acceptance and commitment therapy, there's many, many examples of how it solves a whole multitude of, um, of problems at the, uh, at the um, individual uh, level. Now, when we move up to small groups, these same methods can cause groups, not the groups that Eleanor Ostrom studied, but other groups, including classroom groups, to do much better. And there's a, a game called the Good Behavior Game, which I've been talking about um, during this visit and other meetings, which takes a disruptive classroom and turns it and, and basically implements a culture of cooperation in a classroom environment. And the way it works is you get the kids, this is sometimes done with, usually done with first and second graders, the small kids, 
and you ask them what counts as good and bad behavior. And even small children know is what they're supposed to do, even when they don't do it. But the fact that they discuss it and then they decide by consensus what's good and bad behavior makes a difference compared to if they're simply told what to do. So that ties into Ostrom's principle of consensus decision making. So once, the, once we're clear about what counts as good behavior, then the class is broken up into groups and the groups compete to be good. <laughs> and they just do the same classroom stuff that they did before, but the teacher is counting bad behaviors. And in any group that manages not to exceed a certain number of bad behaviors, they get a small reward, and it can be a very small reward. And so now the groups are competing to be good, and peer pressure, which is typically reinforcing bad behavior, now is reinforcing good behavior. At first the game is played briefly, and the, and the reward is immediate. Then the game is lengthened, it's played unannounced, the reward is delayed, and before long, the, the culture of cooperation just becomes the culture of the classroom. And in very comprehensive randomized controlled trials, when this game is played in the first and second grade, and those kids are tracked now in, their, in adulthood, this intervention, which only took place in the first and second grade, has lifelong consequences. And the young adults who had that experience are doing much better than their uh, counterparts that, uh, uh, that uh, didn't. And by the way, this, 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 uh, this technique is now being implemented in the uh, province of Manitoba at a massive scale in a longitudinal study in which we'll be able to track the effects of the good behavior game in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Manitoba schools. And so and that, of course, can spread. So that's uh, something that you should, uh, you should know about. And then amazingly, these prevention scientists are able to change cultural practices at the scale of entire states. So it turns out that in the United States, um, cigarette sales to minors in convenience stores is monitored. So the, 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 the government maintains a, a team of under, uh, underaged agents that go into convenience stores and try to buy cigarettes. And if they succeed, and if a state exceeds a certain level, then the state has put on notice that they will lose millions of dollars in block grants if they don't bring this problem under control. And the states of Wyoming and Wisconsin were faced with this problem, and they went to Dennis Embry and Tony Biglin and said, won't you help us reduce the rate that convenience stores sell cigarettes to minors? And they did it in 60 days. Now, we want to know about this. And us cultural evolutionists want to know about this, because what this is, is cultural evolution in action. How did they do it? And the first thing they did was they, they knew that they had to establish a norm. I hope you can see some commonalities here. In the good behavior game, the first thing you had to do was establish a norm. That was easy, because it was just a class of first graders. How do you establish a norm at a statewide scale? You have to do an advertising campaign. You have to get important people. You have to get the mayor. You have to get the celebrities all to say it's bad thing for, to sell cigarettes to minors. And that has to be communicated to the convenience store owners. And through the owners, it has to be communicated to the clerks. Then the clerks have to be reinforced for their good behavior. That's another thing which is easy in a small group. It comes naturally in a small group. But on a statewide scale, it's something that has to be engineered. And so, it, so, and so Dennis and Tony had their own team of undergraduate, uh, of underage agents who would go in and try to buy uh, cigarettes. If they, if they succeeded, then there would be a gentle reminder, did you know that this is against the law? And if they, if they were refused, then there was abundant praise. It was, it was uh, the person, the clerk's, the clerk's photograph was put on the wall, there were local articles, and, and there were coupons from the local businesses. And so abundant praise and mild punishment is the rule, which is what takes place naturally in a small group. You don't even have to do it in a small group. That's what comes naturally. But in a large group, it needs to be engineered. Now, it's a tense situation when some tough underage teenagers come in and try to buy cigarettes, and you're a clerk, and you're alone in the store. So is there anything we can do to help out the clerks in this situation? 
Well, let's have a contest. So let's have a contest among the clerks and find out the snappiest thing that you might say in response to this. And so they did that, and then they got the snappiest responses, and they printed that out on cards, and now on every desk and every convenience store, there's a card, and all the clerk has to do is hand a card, and then there's a nice thing to do. Okay? Very straightforward, but that is a variation in selection process. Variation in selection, that's what evolution is at its, at its, uh, at its rear. Now here's a third group, the Cooperative Group of the UK, which is a federation of cooperative businesses uh, that descended from a single group in the 19th century who called themselves the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers. This was a customer-owned business during the Industrial Revolution, and it has grown into a giant corporation whose futuristic headquarters, looking all the world like some kind of beehive, is in Manchester, England. And so these people have developed their own principles of, uh, of cooperation. And uh, the social action department is headed by Paul Monahan, who happens to be a microbiologist by training, and is fully aware of the implications of evolutionary theory for uh, human uh, uh, cooperation. And so these different disciplines, all successful in their own rights, but all not interacting with each other, we have integrated and then generalized from an evolutionary perspective. Here's two academic outputs. Just email me if you want the details. But I'm very actually proud of this article with Eleanor Ostrom, which was uh, completed uh, just before her death, which is titled uh, Generalizing the Core Design Principles for the Efficacy of Groups. And then this article with my uh, prevention science friends called Evolving the Future Toward a Science of Intentional uh, Change. And so this is our, we're basically, this is how we're presenting this to a academic uh, audience. And then, of course, we're trying to implement this in real world situations. And so next I'm going to talk, I'm going to tell you about some of the, our efforts to implement these practices in Binghamton, New York, in a school environment, a program called the Regents Academy, and then in a neighborhood environment, a program called Design Your Own uh, Park. So there are the Ostrom design principles that make sense from her political science perspective and also from an evolutionary perspective. And here's a group uh, in the city of Binghamton. Uh, it's a bunch of teenagers. And actually, they formed their own group. This is a dance troupe that they've formed called 2SK, Two Smooth Kids. And uh, you can look them up on, on, on YouTube. Um, all except for uh, that guy here he looks out of place. That's the mayor of Binghamton, <laughs> New York, Mayor Matt Ryan. And I love showing this photograph because this is a group that the kids form for themselves. And you can look at the joy on their, on their faces. Also, I love it. It's just an ethnic rainbow. And if you go back to those design principles, you'd find that this group that these kids have made for themselves scores pretty high on those design principles. They know who they are. They know what they're doing. Probably they do most everything by uh, consensus. Monitoring is, is, uh, is uh, easy and all of that sort of, uh, all that sort of stuff. And so that gives this group a kind of a vitality that we wish most groups uh, have. Not so the average classroom <laughs> environment. Just think back to your own classroom experience or to the experience of your children and ask, whether their school experience, how that scores with respect to those uh, design features, especially from the perspective of a um, at-risk uh, student. Sometimes it scores very high, by the way. Some people have very good classroom experience. Some people love going to high school. I wager for those reasons. But for many other people, that is not the case. And so when we were asked to advise a program, a new program for at-risk high school students in Binghamton, New York, what we did was we sat down with the principal and the teachers of this new program, and we said, let's see what we can do to build in these particular design features. And I don't have time to tell you exactly how we did it, but there's an article written on it so you can find out more about it. But the point is, is this is... That's what we want to do, is we want to look at real-world groups, and then we want to examine them with respect to these design principles, and we want to see how can we build in these design features. And if we do, will those groups work better? Okay? Now, 
this core set is necessary but not sufficient. And for any particular objective, there might be other design principles that need to be built in. And if the objective is education, then we thought there's two other features that an educational environment needs to have. And the first has to do with making the environment safe and secure as opposed to uh, threatening. So fear is very motivating, but only for escaping the fearful situation. And the kind of learning that we want requires a safe and secure and playful environment. And so it needs to be the case that when the kids come to school, they feel safe and secure and playful. That is what's needed for human development, for healthy human development. This is sometimes called broaden and build. If we didn't have periods of safety and security, then we couldn't actually broaden and build our development, both our social development and our personal development. Whenever things are dangerous and tough, and things are in short supply, then we just become trained upon those things and we are not broadening and building. So we need to build a safe and secure social environment. Another thing we need to do is to recognize is that for any species, including ourselves, it's very difficult to learn when all the costs are in the present and all the benefits are in the future. This is a wonderful book by uh, the psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who's best known for uh, his book Flow, for studying peak psychological experience. And in this study, he followed a cohort of teenagers who were recognized as gifted. So this is the gifted end of the bell curve. They were recognized as gifted in the ninth grade. And he followed them throughout high school, and he asked the question, how many of them remain gifted in the twelfth grade? And the answer was, mostly those who enjoyed what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It had to be rewarding over the short term. If you tell a ninth grader that they're gifted in math and they could have a distinguished career in math, that's not good enough because it's not, if it's not rewarding over the short term. And so unless you can make learning rewarding over the short term, forget about it. Even for the gifted kids, and how much more for the, um, for the at-risk kids. And so, these were the principles, the design principles, that we tried to build in to this high school program as best we could with the resources that were available uh, to us. And then we did a randomized control trial, which means this, that we, our program could accommodate 60 kids, and so we recruited 120 that fit our criteria, which was mainly that they had to have flunked three or more courses in the previous year. And then we randomly allocated half of those kids to the program, and half of those kids went right back to experience the normal high school routine. And so now, if, there was, if the program worked or it didn't work, we would know it. That's the kind of assessment that you need to, uh, that you need to uh, do. And we looked at quarterly grades, the state mandated exams, and then developmental assets, which is basically how you think about yourself as a person, your assets as a person, and your, the assets of your social environment. So these are some non-academic variables. And so here are the results. What we find is that when we put the kids in this new social environment that we created, their performance increased more or less right away. By the first quarter, the kids in the Regents Academy popped up like a cork in terms of their performance. And I actually want to make a, a connection with some of the work of uh, Aaron Aronze, and I'm not sure that he's here, but he's one of the people involved in PEC. But he makes the point about religion, that when you look at the impact of religion on human behavior, it turns out to be much more situational than you might think. So it's not a fact that religion, it's not necessarily the case that religion makes you a better person in some general sense, so that you're a nicer person across the board. It's only when you put a person in a religious environment that they behave better. So it's situational. And so it seems here that what we did was we create a different environment, and then we put people in that environment, and then right away they behave better. Actually, that's an exaggeration, because it's, it's, and that's, that's quite an extreme exaggeration, because, because um, one of the things that this program had to do, and did do, was to gain the trust of these students. And that was not something that you could do overnight, basically. You had to demonstrate your commitment to these 
students. You had to demonstrate that you were there for them. You had to give a lot of TLC, basically, before these, before these kids actually became convinced this was a safe and secure uh, social environment. But once they did become convinced, then their performance shot up like a cork. Here's the results of the state-mandated exams. These are the same exams taken by everyone. And for four subjects, we have a comparison between the Regents Academy, the comparison group, and this is the average high school student. And what it shows is, for each and every subject, not only did the Regents Academy students do much, much better than the comparison group, but they actually performed on a par with the average high school student. And so by this measure, at least, which, by the way, is an inadequate measure, this program erased the deficit of years as far as their performance was, uh, was uh, concerned. And then with respect to developmental assets, uh, the kids in the Regents Academy reported uh, more social support than in the comparison group by a lot. Uh, their family support was better. That was in part because we worked a little bit with the families, but also because the families were just very pleased that their kids were now doing we're doing uh, better now. Um, there was no effect of religion because the, because the program had no um, impact on religion, uh, no effect on extracurricular activities because the program was not about that, um, and uh, did have an effect on, uh, on the well-being of, uh, of, um, of the individuals. And this, was, this benefit was across the board. It worked for uh, boys and girls, and all ethnic categories uh, improved to an equal, equal um, Degree. And so this is all reported in a paper in a Plus One called A Program for At-Risk High School Students Informed by Evolutionary uh, Science, which uh, provides some of the, uh, uh, some of the details um, uh, for you. Okay, so this is a success story, basically, that we were able to take these principles and we were able to cause a group to do, uh, to do uh, better. Now let's use the same principles for a in a neighborhood context, and the way we did this was by organizing a competition among neighborhoods, just as with the good behavior game, there was a competition among groups, we organized among a competition among neighborhoods for the ability to design their own park. And the idea here is to provide a common resource for a neighborhood. So in Ostrom's groups, they had a common resource that they were trying to manage. And we provided a common resource in the form of the opportunity to create a park in a vacant lot or some other neglected space in your uh, neighborhood. And then for those groups that became involved, we would coach those groups, and the criteria for the competition would be such is that we would basically try to endow those groups with the same design features that Ostrom had shown work for common pool uh, resource uh, groups. And then the idea was that if neighborhoods became organized in the context of building a park, then they would become organized and begin to manage their affairs in other respects. And so we could take a dysfunctional neighborhood and we could turn it into a functional neighborhood. Okay. Now if you go down that list of design principles and then think of an average neighborhood, especially a dysfunctional neighborhood, and ask the question, how many have a strong group identity, how many make decisions by consensus, so on and so forth, you can see that most neighborhoods score very, many neighborhoods score very, very poorly in those regards. So can we actually build up a neighborhood in this, uh, in this respect? And so one neighborhood that became involved uh, actually lived next to an existing city park, although a pretty sad one. And they had been trying to improve this park for a long time, and basically with no success, despite kind of good meaning on all sides. So basically they were trying to get the city to do stuff. Uh, the city said it was, was well-meaning, but nothing was happening and that had been taking place over a period of years. And so working with this group, we first of all got them to hold neighborhood events in the park, and then to do brainstorming, to design a park that was inclusive of the neighborhood. That's an important thing because consensus decision making, right? And so they developed this plan for a park, which has of course gotten much more than they were ever thinking of, uh, ever thinking of before. This, is, this started about three years ago. And it's been very fascinating to look. Obviously, this is a bigger project and a more complicated project than trying to change a school uh, program. And one thing that happened in 2011 was the worst flood in the history of the city of Binghamton. And that park was under four feet of water, actually, at this time last year. And it was quite interesting to see what happened in that totally unexpected case. It turned out that the committee 
the group that had formed and designed the park, actually became involved in flood relief in a way that would not have happened without that committee forming in the context of the park. But this year, I'm proud to say that a lot of this has been implemented, and within the next three weeks, that pavilion is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is going in. Assessing this is a little more difficult than assessing a school program in which the residential location of the public students is, is known, and this enables us to study neighborhood variation in neighborhood quality, basically. And so the dark areas are, are good neighborhoods, the light areas are bad neighborhoods, and there's the location of this particular park. And if this park succeeds in improving the neighborhood, then the students in that neighborhood, the next time they take this survey, they're going to say, my neighborhood is better. And that region will become darker because of the park. And by taking this annual survey, then we can, then we can basically assess anything that we do in the city to this annual measure. So this is part of what it means to, to um, improve the quality of life from an evolutionary um, uh, perspective. Some of our future projects is we're creating student neighborhood associations. So we're taking college students that live in this city and we're forming them into groups. And those groups work on their own behalf, but they also work with us to create neighborhood associations that are inclusive in a different way than the parks. And we're also working on landlord tenant associations. <coughs> this is a section of the city that we call the Valley of Distrust, based on uh, door to door surveys of adults. We ask, how much do you trust your neighbor? And up in this part of the neighborhood, uh, they're trusting. And then there's this gradient down to this part of the neighborhood. And that gradient follows the uh, our, our single family residences as opposed to uh, rentals. And so ask yourself the question, what is it that's so pathological about the rental environment? What is it about the social environment of a rental situation which seems to breed bad behavior in tenants and landlords alike? Look at that against the background of those design principles. Is there anything that you can do to create an association that matches responsible landlords to responsible tenants and build in some of these design principles? And if there is, then you would have improved the quality of life in cities any place on earth uh, through this simple, uh, through this simple uh, means. And so I want to end this section of my talk with the concept of multicellular uh, society. How is it that organisms such as us are able to function as well as we do? Okay. We're a large-scale social unit, but we're composed of smaller scales, and ultimately with cells that also function very well. And when we think of large-scale social units, such as a city or anything above that, I think it's very important for them to be multicellular. The small group is the natural human social environment. And if you're not in a group of individuals in which you're well known and you are respected for what you do and you can recognize your contribution, then you are likely to experience various forms of, of dysfunction because you're not in a, in a healthy social environment. And so what we need to do is we need to create these small groups of all sorts, neighborhood groups, interest groups, and then these groups can interact with each other and with larger entities. That's what polycentric governance is all about. And I think that thinking of it from an evolutionary perspective in terms of a kind of a multicellularity is a very insightful way to um, um, uh, think about it. So based on these success stories within the city of Binghamton, plus these, what's been successful in all these other disciplines, we are now trying to create a framework uh, for um, any group, basically, to increase their efficacy. And so this is a collaborative project involving uh, these uh, various uh, organizations that I've been discussing. And uh, we're trying to provide a framework for uh, increasing the efficacy of groups of all sorts, uh, facilitating their interactions, and creating a scientific database. We're inspired here by Eleanor Ostrom because the way she derived these design principles was by creating this database of common, pe common pool resource groups around the world, mostly from a very diffuse literature and that was sufficient for her to derive these principles. How much better can we do than to take the groups that we're actually working with and put them in a similar database in which we can recurrently go back and get information from them, assess them, have them assess uh, themselves, and to uh, use that as a way to improve our, um, improve our um, uh, knowledge. So this will consist of an internet platform, but it will also consist of a network of trained coaches 
um, uh, based on an association of therapists called the um, Association of uh, Contextual Behavioral Science. It's an association of several thousand uh, people worldwide that are trained in these methods of cognitive uh, behavioral and mindfulness-based therapy. And we can use that to train them to become uh, coaches of groups. And so if you're a group, not only can you get resources from, uh, from uh, the internet, but you could actually engage a person to actually work with you as a kind of a, uh, a, kind of a uh, coach. And currently we're in the uh, pilot stage of this, so basically there's probably 15 or 20 people that are working with groups and are training them in their own way, and then we're going to be comparing our methods and deriving a more formal set of methods for training these groups and for assessing them. And if you are working with groups, then there's an opportunity for you to become involved in this, in this uh, process. So I invite you to contact me, and, to, uh, and uh, you might be able to get involved in this process in its, uh, in its early stages. In a way, although you'll see that the same principles are, are um, at play here. And to think about the topic of, um, of, um, of um, economics. This was another topic that we became involved in, uh, starting with the economic crash of 2008. And so economics is a huge topic. Uh, it's been entwined with evolutionary theory from the very uh, uh, beginning. Darwin was inspired by Adam Smith and, and, um, and uh, Malthus. Uh, Babelin, one of the great e economists of the 19th century, wrote an article in 1898, and why is uh, economic not an evolutionary science? Uh, there's even a branch of uh, econ uh, economics called evolutionary economics. And so, but despite this complex uh, and intertwined history, it is not the case that evolution functions as a general theoretical framework for economics in the same way that it does for uh, evolutionary biology, and, uh, and it needs to. And currently, economics is dominated by what's often called the uh, orthodox theory. This is neoclassical uh, economics. Uh, this originated in the 19th century uh, by uh, Walrus, among others. And uh, his inspiration was to create a physics of social behavior that was comparable to Newton's laws of motion. And you can just imagine going back then and the allure of, of, of Newton and other, and other physicists who were doing this amazing job of describing the physical world with this system of mathematical equations. If you could do that for something like economics, wouldn't that be amazing? And so the goal of creating a self-contained body of mathematical equations that could explain human social behavior was, of course, a very laudable goal. And the central task of the economist, then in addition to now, is to provide some kind of proof for the concept of the invisible hand. And so, as Adam Smith described, isn't it amazing that economies seem to function well, even though individuals do not have the welfare of the economy in mind? How is it possible for the shopkeeper and the businessman and so on, all to be pursuing their own individual interests? They don't have the welfare of the whole society in mind, and yet somehow they, were, they are led as if by an invisible hand for the society to function well. And so the central issue at stake here is to what degree do economies function well without government intervention? To what extent do governments need to intervene or not intervene for economies to function well? And of course, you can all recognize this as the central narrative today in our current political uh, season. And so the uh, uh, orthodox model succeeded in doing this, providing a mathematical proof um, of the invisible hand, but only by making a long list of uh, assumptions about human preferences, human abilities, and the human social uh, environment. So here's how they're described by Eric Weinhocker, the author of a wonderful book called The Origin of Wealth. Um, Orthodox theory assumes that humans are perfectly rational, markets are perfectly efficient, institutions are optimally designed, and economies are self-correcting equilibrium systems that invariably find a state that maximizes social welfare. 
And if you go to the Palgrave Dictionary of Economics, the most recent edition, you will see that laissez-faire leads to the common good is the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics. The best thing that you can do to our economies is to leave it alone, is the first fundamental theorem of welfare uh, um, economics. So that is this sort of dominant paradigm in economics. And the new economic thinking, what we need to do is to assume that humans and their social institutions are products of biocultural evolution, and that modern economies are complex systems that are frequently out of equilibrium, out of equilibrium. And so this new way of thinking about economics draws upon a number of different disciplines. Evolution, for sure, because we're thinking about people as products of evolution, and institutions as products of of, of cultural evolution, and also complex systems theory, because human social institutions are complex and are frequently out of equilibrium. So there's two main bodies of theory that we need to consult. We need to integrate them with each other. And each of those, in turn, is a melting pot of the traditional academic uh, disciplines. And so this is very definitely an interdisciplinary enterprise, and that is in stark contrast with economics as a, as a discipline, which is one of the most encapsulated disciplines that you can, uh, that you can uh, uh, ask for. In fact, when Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009, <laughs> um, who's the guy that wrote Preconomics? Stephen Levitt wrote in his blog in the New York Times on the day after she won the Nobel Prize, he said, if you had asked before today economists who Eleanor Ostrom was and what she did, four out of five wouldn't be able to provide an answer. And he said, I'm embarrassed to say that I have, I have to count myself among them. I had to look up Eleanor Ostrom on Wikipedia to discover who she was and why she won the Nobel Prize. And that, and that award was followed by a stream of insults and outrage as to how, how terrible it was that Ostrom had won the Nobel, Nobel Prize. So this shows you part of the problem in the human-related disciplines and with, and with economics as it is uh, and just typically practiced. So this is truly a paradigmatic departure from orthodox uh, theory. Now behavioral economics is one of the great contenders of uh, of orthodox theory, and there's a lot of stuff written on behavioral economics. Actually, I love behavioral economics, but there's good news and bad news. The good news is, is that uh, uh, folks such as uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, they like to say that economics should be based on homo sapiens, not homo uh, economicus, in their book, uh, uh, Nudge. And there's a, there's a great reliance on, 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 uh, on, on, on empirical research, or psychological research about what people actually do in these situations. Uh, the bad news is, is that this draws mostly upon not just psychology, but a very narrow slice of psychology associated with cognitive heuristics and biases. And those of you, I see a couple nodding heads here, so those of you that are knowledgeable about this. And there's a lot more to psychology than, than cognitive heuristics and, and, and biases. And so the result is, is that if you look at the behavioral economics literature, what you find is actually go to, go to, go to Wikipedia. <laughs> And look, at, look up behavioral economics, and you will see a long, long list of what's called paradoxes and anomalies. Goofy things that people do that, and the problem with that is, it's only goofy against the background of the orthodox model. And so basically, behavioral economics is yet to escape the orbit of orthodox economics. And when you do escape the orbit, then all of these things that seem goofy actually fall into place as part of the evolved human, uh, human uh, uh, psychology. And so uh, behavioral economics is a, is, is a step in the right direction, but only a um, uh, step. And so uh, we became involved in uh, 2008, as I said, and we uh, collaborated with the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center. We've had conferences and workshops. Bottom line is, is that I feel actually pretty uh, confident about this topic now, not because of but basically because I've been able to work in collaboration with so many dozens of, um, of people, including many, many economists, including people from other, other uh, uh, disciplines. And so now I just want to you know, sample two you know, pieces of this, is how we can go beyond the orthodox um, um, 
theory. So one reason that the orthodox theory has survived as long as it has is because of one of the most influential articles in economics by Milton Friedman in 1953 called The Methodology of Positive um, Economics, in which he basically says, yeah, orthodox theory has been criticized by everyone for its assumptions as being you know, not possibly descriptive of uh, humans. Nevertheless, he said, it's possible for the theory to be true, and despite the fact that the assumptions are false, okay? So, and you, so he said, how can that be, right? And he gave three examples by analogy. He said, consider a tree that optimizes its exposure of leaves to sunlight. So the tree is optimizing, but of course we know the tree is not performing cal complicated calculations. Natural selection caused the tree to optimize. Or he said, consider an expert pool player who makes all these complicated shots. That's based on countless hours of play. The pool player is not calculating necessarily anything. Or consider a corporation which is maximizing its profit. Is that because the managers of the corporation are so very smart and know what they are doing? Or is it because that corporation is simply the survivor? And then the corporations that did not maximize their profits, they went extinct. Okay. And so the way that the Friedman's as-if argument relied upon three examples of variation in selection, a genetic evolution example with the trees, a learning example with the pool player, and a cultural evolution example with the, uh, with the uh, firm. Now actually, this as-if argument is a respectable argument. It's one that evolutionists use all the time. And it draws upon the distinction between ultimate and proximate causation. Everything that evolves requires two explanations. Why is it there compared to all the things that could have been there, often based on the winnowing action of natural selection? And how does it work in a mechanistic sense? And so evolutionists all the time reason on the basis of ultimate causation without caring much about the proximate mechanism. And so I can say that the, uh, that the bird foraging out there is foraging in a way to maximize its energy intake. And I'm probably right, but I don't care what the bird is actually thinking when it does it. I can say that species that live in the desert are probably sandy colored to conceal themselves from their predators and prey. And I don't care about the genes or, the, or the, anything that's actually responsible for causing them to be sandy colored in a mechanistic sense. And so basically, the idea of reasoning about something as if they're optimizing, even when they're not, is a perfectly respectable <coughs> argument. It's one that evolutionists use all the time. But it has to be done well, and it has to be done in a sophisticated way. In addition to the classic argument by Milton Friedman, there's another classical article by Stephen Jay Gould for being too naively adaptationist about using this way of thinking. And so that what, what emerged from that was a more sophisticated way of thinking about adaptation in which you must test one adaptationist hypothesis against another, you must test adaptationist hypotheses against non-adaptationist hypotheses, and that is the way that evolutionists actually should do uh, science. And so when you examine Friedman's argument in, in, on behalf of neoclassical economics, what you find is, is that it is an extremely naive form of adaptationism against the background of the way evolutionists need to uh, do adaptation. And so this is, um, I wrote an article on this called A Tale of Two Classics, in which I was the first person to compare Friedman's article to uh, Gould and Lewinton's article. And uh, this is actually my subtitle. They didn't actually use it, but uh, this is the one I prefer. Two classic articles, one from the field of economics and one from the field of evolution, have never been related to each other. When they are, only one remains standing. So this is where you can go back and you can look at some of these pillars that are holding up this paradigm. And you could actually make a lot of progress from an evolutionary perspective in, um, in um, uh, critiquing these uh, paradigms. And then we can uh, do the same for the invisible hand uh, metaphor. Let's think about the invisible hand metaphor and see if it has any justification 
from an evolutionary perspective. <coughs> Can we justify the invisible hand metaphor from an evolutionary perspective? So there's two aspects of the metaphor. One, society functions well as a unit. And two, the members of that society do not have the welfare of the society in mind. And we can evaluate this for any assemblage of organisms, not just uh, uh, humans. So here we have a comparison with the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, and what I can call the first fundamental theorem of multi-level selection. Again, for background, consult your colleagues here at, uh, at, um, in, um, in Vancouver, which is that for anything higher level unit, such as a group, to be adaptive, selection has to be operating on the group level, you know, selecting groups compared to other groups. And selection operating within groups, selecting individuals compared to other individuals within groups, tends to select for behaviors which basically maximize your slice of the pie, but is not necessarily good for the pie itself. And so selection operating within units tends to undermine the, the welfare of the unit. And you need to have a process of, 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 of group level selection in order for the groups to function as adaptive units. And so somehow we have to reconcile these two um, uh, statements here if we can. So here's what we can say at a very basic and fundamental level. When an animal society is not a product of group selection, it does not function well as a unit, and the first aspect of the invisible hand is not satisfied. This is something which is actually, if you're not an evolutionist, it might seem a little bit strange that there's animal societies out there which remain, you know, the individuals remain in groups. But when you examine those societies, they are dysfunctional societies. There are societies in which individuals are succeeding at the expense of others, and that is not good for the group. Do you know that many behaviors evolved in males that are actually detrimental to females, and the reverse? So life is full of conflict, basically, and sometimes conflict wins. And that's what you see, is basically groups of individuals that are just fighting with each other, and that's the end, that's, that's, that's it. Life's a bitch, and then you die. Okay? And so for those groups, the invisible hand metaphor does not apply because the first aspect does not apply. Basically, the group simply does not function as an adaptive unit. So we don't satisfy the first aspect of the invisible hand metaphor until we have groups that are products of group, uh, uh, group selection. And when we do, then the second aspect of the invisible hand is, is usually satisfied because the members of animal groups typically don't even have minds in the human sense. They evolved as symbiotic associations of bacteria, societies of bacteria that became so integrated that, the, that, the, that the, 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 the group became a higher level organism. And so the nucleated cell functions well, and the mitochondria and the chloroplasts do not have the welfare of the group in mind because they don't have minds in the human sense of the, of the work. So also for a multicellular organism, we function pretty well until we get cancer. And our cells and our genes do not have our welfare in mind. They simply turn on and off and they, they respond to their local environment because we've been selected. The individuals whose genes and, and cells functioned well, they were the ones who were selected compared to the ones that, that didn't. And then we have beehives, amazing social insect colonies, which are truly groups, sometimes with many millions of individuals, which are physically separated from each other, unlike the cells in our, in our body, but amazingly operate like a single organism. And so, those function well as units, but the bees don't have the welfare of the colony in mind. They don't have minds in the human sense of the word, either. And so if you want proof of the invisible hand metaphor, Go to biology and go to these units. These are excellent examples of the invisible hand uh, metaphor. And it's against that background that we can add the human case. And here again, I have, to, I have to assume a lot of background, and I have to tell you that what's been taking place over the last really few decades is a kind of a dawning awareness that the reason that we are such a cooperative species, especially in small groups, but even thanks to cultural evolution in large groups, is because of a process 
of group level selection and cause group human, some human groups to do better than other human groups on the basis of their teamwork. And the idea that teamwork is the signature adaptation of our species. Probably the first thing that happened in human evolution to set us apart from other primate species was that we became more cooperative. And at that point, we started to function as teams, both in the context of physical activities and in the context of mental activities. So our ability to learn things and transmit them to each other, and especially our ability for symbolic thought, so that we could actually take information, learn information, encode it as symbolic, in a symbolic form, and transmit it across generations. All are cooperative uh, activities. And so what that means is, is to the extent that human groups function as cooperative units, the first ingredient of the invisible hand is satisfied. And the mechanisms that evolved that caused us to, that caused us to become such team players need not require having the welfare of the group in mind. It could, but it need not. And so the second aspect of the invisible hand can also be satisfied. What that means is that Adam Smith was right. There is a sense in which human society functions well without the individuals having the welfare of the society in mind. But the way those individuals do behave bears no resemblance whatsoever to the economic concept of self-interest. It's another set of ways that we behave, which is much more complex and is actually pretty well described by Adam Smith in his other book, A Theory of Moral Sentiments. There he developed a nuanced understanding of all the different traits that we have, including some of the other oriented, some are self-oriented, the whole moral psychology. These are the things that cause us to behave well as groups. And the idea that we're all trying to maximize our economic self-interest, and that somehow robustly leads to uh, groups functioning well, is, is, is actually as wrong as it could possibly be. And so what we have is, is we could actually, we, we can come up with a concept of the invisible hand, which is justified by evolutionary theory, but it's very different than the received version. And so I hope you can see how evolutionary theory is actually undercutting some of the foundational principles of the orthodox uh, model. Okay, so just to summarize here, um, I've talked about three waves of evolutionary uh, thought. First wave started with Darwin. Second wave, uh, as I said, of course it's in some sense it's old, but in other respects it only uh, resumed momentum and late in the, in the uh, 20th century. And so much going on in the academic study of humans is from this evolutionary perspective. The kind of synthesis that's taking now for their understanding of our own species is comparable to the synthesis that took place in the biological sciences uh, in the 20th century and, of course, continuing. So that makes it a very exciting time intellectually. And once again, that's happening right here with uh, Eck and, and Cirque and, and the other people that are involved uh, doing similar work at both, um, at both universities. So that is just you know, awesome to think that our understanding of ourselves might be as unified as our understanding of the rest of the biological um, world. But then, it's, to me, it's even more exciting that the third wave, that this can be used as a theory to improve the quality of everyday life. This is something that's only happening just now. And it makes me very optimistic that some of the problems that have been so recalcitrant and seem like they just won't go away, actually there will be solutions to these problems once we understand them from an evolutionary uh, perspective. So, thank you very much. You've talked about some of your projects where you've had ideas and then you've organized projects and you've had a chance to test the ideas. Would you like to talk about some untested daydreams on the subject of evolution? Say, things that you've thought about that maybe you haven't had a chance to test, but just sort of speculation. Oh gosh, that, that, that question takes me unprepared. I, uh, uh, Could you repeat your question, please? Uh, yeah, please repeat the question and give me some more time to think about it. <laughs> oh, I repeat the question, okay. So I've talked about some things that we've tried and that worked and so on. Could, could I speculate, could I talk about some things that are more in the future, basically, that, uh, uh, that I'm kind of thinking about but haven't yet uh, 
tribe, is that right? Right, and so uh, I'll name a couple. One is quality of life, basically, what that means and how we can improve it in a more general sense. And, uh, and so that's a, pro a future project that we're trying to implement, which actually involves a consortium of cities. So one thing that we want to do is we want to create a consortium of cities that are patterned after this concept. And then another that I'll mention uh, is, is the project that we're starting at the same time that these guys are starting their project on religion and spirituality. And although that's a great topic from an academic perspective, but what does it mean if we could also study religion and spirituality in the context of everyday um, of life? And that's one of the things that we're doing that I talked about uh, yesterday. Take the concept of spirituality for a minute. And one of the things I love to do is to take words that seem to be intangible, like spirit and soul, and to ask, what are these things really? And why are we impelled to use these words? And to take the word spirit or spiritual, and to ask, you know, what is that? How would you define a spiritual person? Define for me uh, a really spiritual person. And after you succeed at doing that, then I'm going to play a game, a mental thought experiment, which is to imagine that this individual, imagine that first of all, no one is like that. Nobody is spiritual. And then imagine a mutant individual which is like that, a mutant individual who is a spiritual person. And drop that person into the population and ask, how would they fare? And is there any scenario that we could imagine that would cause that spiritual person to spread by a purely Darwinian process. And I actually think that if you go through that procedure, then you could actually, that you could actually succeed in showing why spirituality can be successful, not for everybody, but at least for some individuals, or in a population sense, at a certain frequency in the population. And then you can begin to think about spirituality from a purely evolutionary perspective whatever religious associations it might, it might have. And you can see that spirituality would have a distribution and abundance. I could even create a map in which there would be, you know, spirituality would be more here than there. So to me, that would be, what, it's actually what I'm trying to do. The same is true with altruism, niceness in all of its forms. So, so imagine the nice individual, and I'm not saying they're genetically nice, that's actually not important. What's important is, is that for, for Phenotypically, when individuals behave in these ways, that we wish all people would behave. Think about it as a, as a strategy in a Darwinian contest. And then ask this question, why has it maintained itself in, that, in, in the population? And what you'll typically find is, is that it's successful under some circumstances and not others. And once you know that, then you can grow the niche of the behaviors that you're trying to that you're trying to facilitate. And that might be spirituality, it might be altruism, it might be other forms of, of, of prosociality. So that's the sense in which we're thinking about evolution in, a, in this expansive sense. And I hope that was at least a partial answer to your question. Yeah. Ideology. Yeah. Is ideology banished from the organization of people? Is that, you know, uh, I'm wondering whether or not you're talking about planning, for example where people come together. I understand how you can actually get there, you know, but can you have a sort of a government ideology as such in the implementation of the plan? What role will that ideology play? That's an important question, so I'm going to ask you to repeat it, and then I'll try to repeat it back, but that's a very important question I'm eager to talk about. Well, I'm just interested in, I'm thinking here that, well, you could probably have, uh, you were talking about free markets, and you know, the, the implication is that you get non-free markets. Uh, uh, and let's say, uh, um, John Voigt got up of the National, the Republican National Convention the other day, and he said, uh, Obama is not a Democrat, he's a radical socialist. <laughs> so I, I'm just wondering what a role you know, in ideology, whatever it is, what role can it play in the implementation or in, in the design? 
for example, of any of your programs? Right, so what role does ideology play in the implementation or design of some of these programs? Let's think about ideology, right? And so, if we go way back, I think, and this is another one of these, what I like to call evolution 101 insights. When we, when we approach a topic from an evolutionary perspective, there's some insights which are very sophisticated and they involve genes and nerves and hormones and, 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 and fancy stuff like that. But some insights are just very, very elementary. Like the approximate ultimate distinction, for example. If you're not comfortable with the approximate ultimate distinction, that can be very um, insightful if you're not already familiar with it. And so here's another evolution 101 insight. Uh, from the standpoint of natural selection, the only reason that we should believe anything is in terms of what it causes us to do. The truth value of a belief counts for nothing except insofar as it causes us what to do. And so when we think of beliefs in this sort of, in, in this sort of utilitarian sense, that it makes us think hard, I think, at, at a basic level about epistemology in general. How do we know anything? And that makes us think hard about what is the relationship between the factual content of a belief and the practical content, what it causes us to do. And it helps us understand why, we're, why we believe in falsehoods and why we're so, why we're so uh, um, capable of believing falsehoods and even defending falsehoods to the death is because, is because those beliefs which are factually incorrect are extremely important in causing us to behave in ways that we might need to behave. And so not only does that explain the counterfactual nature of religion, my religion involves all these beliefs about stuff that's not out there. Well, just ask yourself, and that seems such a puzzle to the scientific mind, just ask yourself what those beliefs cause people to do, and most of that puzzle goes away. And so also for any kind of ideology, political ideology or any, any intellectual ideology, is basically we need to evaluate them on what they cause people to do. And it also gives you a little sympathy for ideologies, because the fact is, is that no culture has ever been such as that we're all function as scientists and all of its complexity, and then, and then that tells us what to do. So there's a sense in which there's a need for narrative and a need for ideology, but there's also a need to connect it to the science. And so actually one of the things we're working on, it's one of, uh, I'm back to something new that I'm very, very excited to begin thinking about, we call the science to narrative chain. So science by itself isn't enough. Somehow we need to create a powerful narrative on the basis of the science, and that could be just as punchy and short as what you just described. Something that you can convey in a single sentence and has emotional power and all of that. So basically, there needs to be narrative, but that narrative needs to be connected to the science. And either one by itself is insufficient. So how can we create a chain from the best science to the best narrative? And we're, we're just starting to think about the science to narrative chain, and I'm really excited about it. So you will have, for example, you, you, you will value a sort of association or alliance with an interfaith group in getting to the end of a, having a particular kind of an outcome. Uh, one more time, okay? Well, I mean, if an interfaith group, for example, is, well, we will assume that they're not necessarily scientific. Right. right? Uh, but they seem to be doing useful work. Right. Um, so I'm wondering whether or not you will value an alliance to certain anticipated outcomes or expected outcomes in, in your various projects with people like that. Totally. Absolutely. And, not, and that's exactly what we're doing, basically. So I'm happy not only just to work with churches, but actually to pack those churches based on, based on what they do, basically. And we have to be respectful about the various cracks of that mechanism. I, and and uh, I'm lucky, along with my colleagues here, to be studying religion very hard. And then, so you hear the same, here, here's the kind of thing you hear religious folks saying all the time. I have a Jewish colleague who's also a very observant Jew. And he says, when I go to the synagogue, I don't care what the person next to me thinks about God, frankly, at all. I care that he's there. 
And that's what it means to be ecumenical, basically, is that, is that you're there for a reason, and that reason, if it's communitarian, then you'll forgive somebody the particular way that they, that they uh, think about it. And so that kind of tolerance is, I think, an extremely important thing, because at the end of the day, it is based on what we, it is based on what we do. Uh, yeah, um, I Right, and, and I, in my own mind, I think of ecology and evolution as joined as the hip. So, um, and it's very interesting that in academia, uh, uh, departments are, been, are typically labeled as an acronym, EEV, ecology, evolution, behavior, because all of those things have been joined at the hip. You cannot actually be an evolutionist without being an ecologist, because all species are, are basically um, evolved in relation to their and, my, and you can't be an ecologist because the species that you're studying, all of these strategies that evolved by, by um, evolution. And so uh, I don't feel the need to add ecology to evolution because for me, they're already fused. But I recognize that that's not the case with everyone. And so when you mention both, I think, what you're trying to establish in the mind of somebody else is what's already thoroughly established in my own, sure. in my own mind. It's just that you have um, two they're, they're meeting in the middle, and at any given moment, you've got those coordinates. Yeah, and for the benefit of the people that weren't in my talk yesterday, I talked about uh, basically cultural ecosystems, so that if you take any, any population, even one the size of a very small city like Binghamton, New York, it's not just a single thing. There's many entities, many groups, and actually individuals participating in many groups, and each one of those is like a species. And so that makes the, the, the large population a collection of species that are interacting with each other in an ecological fashion. One of the reasons that helps, to again reiterate something I said yesterday, is that some of my evolutionist new atheist colleagues basically say things like that religion fundamentally predisposes groups to be violent to other groups. That's a serious claim that's made by some of my own colleagues, such as uh, Richard uh, Dawkins. But if you actually look at that from a proper ecological and evolutionary perspective, you can see how ridiculous that is, because the, the relationships among species can be the whole range, from predatory to competitive, all the, way over to, all the way over to mutualism. And so when you actually look at groups, including religious groups, in various ecologies, then what you find is that in many ecologies you find that there's no one prone to violence, and often they're prone to collaboration. And then, of course, you can get into other ecologies in which, of course, you'll get prone to violence, and religions will be very good at that because religions are very good at most things. <laughs> and so, and so, and that's a much more it is still threatened because the practices are not continuing necessarily because of, of things like personnel turnover. And so we worked with the principal, we had a close relationship with her. Basically, all of that got implemented through the principal. The teachers themselves didn't really get it as far as the, the principles were concerned. Now the principle has been reassigned and other changes have occurred and it's like shocking to me and, 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 and very um, um, you know, alarming that this, this, this program that works so well only now it's in its third year. I actually have to work just to get it to continue. Now here's another example. We have a plan to increase attendance. Attendance is a huge problem in America. And, and we have excellent data that shows that in, in any program, in our program that works, or in the normal school system that doesn't work so well for at-risk students, in both cases, the more you attend, the better you do. They're like parallel lines. So if we can increase attendance, we want to know about it. So here's how we're going to increase attendance. We're going to, we're going to work with the school system 
We're going to get attendance information on each and every student. We're going to update it monthly. We're going to geotag it. And we're going to generate a GIS map of attendance that we refresh every month. And it's like an economic indicator. And here's, the, here's, here's the report card for the city of Binghamton for attendance. Here's the neighborhoods that are doing it well. Here's the what are they doing? We'll do a variation selection. We'll find out. We'll try to report. We'll do all of that. And all I have to do is to get the city, the, the school system, to, uh, to take their data and to process that data in a way that gives us those, those maps. And they want to do it. There's no pushback. But it still might not be done. Because it involves changing habitual routines. It involves things that you wouldn't even think of. That basically the data packages that school uses, they're designed and they take the information and they issue reports. If you want to do something different with the data, then you can't work with that, that kind of thing. Or everyone's busy, you get the picture. And so just changing anything turns out to be difficult. That's what makes that, uh, that uh, cigarette study so amazing, is that they were able to change um, um, uh, those practices. And I think that, that <clears throat> this is another future thing, is that now that, we have, now that we're thinking hard as scientists about cultural evolution and cultural transmission, cultural inheritance systems and things like that, that this, will, this, this academic knowledge will, will actually help us ensure this, what should take place naturally, basically. We'd like, we'd like the things that work to spread. And that's another thing which happens naturally in a small group context, but does not necessarily happen naturally or at all in a large group context. So if you're in a small group and you do something that's useful, I notice it, I copy it, and we're done. But if someplace in Kansas does something that works well, how am I going to know in New York? In fact, I mean, it's even at a smaller scale. Center. So that which comes naturally, so naturally, at a small scale, is something that has to be engineered at a large scale if it's, if it's going to work at all. So we have to basically build the infrastructure of cultural evolution. And the more we know how cultural evolution works in, in its evolved context, then the better we'll be able to do. And, and also, the more we know about such things as religious traditions, which are doing a pretty good job of continuity, then we can borrow from that and we can, and we can make those practices uh, we can make those practices work. Sir? So, you were speaking a lot about eco terms, so ecosystems, ecology, cultural ecology, in the context of cultural evolution. And so, I just want to ask you simply what, in your mind, is the role of the individual human mind or the psyche in the context of? cultural evolution. We're talking, about, we're talking about the evolution of culture at the group level and how we're designing ecosystems to promote certain types of behavior and things. So what is the role of the individual mind now? So one tier down in the hierarchy, causally, or what, how do you think about that? How do you conceive of that? Um, well, let me give two um, answers to that. One is that this is a very individualistic culture. And so most of us are accustomed to thinking of individual minds as self-contained minds. And as we think more about groups as functional units, uh, one possibility that emerges is the concept of a group mind. And that seems like science fiction to a lot of people. But there's a very interesting sense, and if you go to the social insects, there is the most wonderful literature on how a social insect colony functions as a as a group mind, in which the individual bee is more like a neuron than a uh, self-contained uh, unit. Thomas Seeley's work is among the best for, uh, uh, for that. And to think of humans in that context, that in some ways we're just kind of nodes in this group level process playing a role, there's going to be a lot of insight in, um, uh, in that. So to gravitate a little bit away from, the, from this default way that we have thinking about individual minds. But that said, I think that in terms of um, uh, deriving successful policies, then the kind of selection that's going to have to take place, you have to call policy selection. 
And so in a selection, especially at the level of large-scale groups, that's actually responsible for why our large groups function today. If you look at why is it that the European nations function at the scale that they, that they do, it's because of history of centuries of warfare is what it, what it is that caused these successful social forms to, and actually it's quite amazing, it's one of the things that the academic literature is telling us. This goes for religions and many other groups. The turnover, I mean, the number of, kind of social arrangements that gets created and culled is enormous, and it's going on all around us. There's a wonderful book called Why Nations Fail by uh, Damon S. Imoglu, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and James R. Robinson, which talks about this kind of variation among social units of all these scales. So basically, that kind of selection is taking place all around us, but then we also need to supplement and in many ways replace it with policy selection. Well, what that means is, is that we think very deliberately about what we need to do, and then we select for those policies. And that's going to be individuals getting together and thinking very much as individuals. And we need more of that, not, not less than that. Uh, there was a, you had a question, I think. Well, this, the business of cultural evolution, like I just may be ignorant, but my, like the um, subtitle of Harold Bloom's book on Shakespeare is The Making of Modern Man. He obviously believed that English literature was more important in forming modern man than philosophy, psychology, and a host of other things. And in trying to plumb the depths of that, and uh, the, uh, in plumb the depths of why Hamlet was so important, I assume that he's talking about the importance of metaphor. <coughs> And I assume that metaphor is associated, it's like the literary manifestation of empathy. And that empathy is a product of mirror neurons. And that my lack of complete appreciation of Hamlet is due to the fact that I'm a few mirror neurons short of a full <laughs> Wait, Was there a question there? <laughs> Yeah, what do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that one of the very exciting developments is to expand evolution beyond genetic evolution. And Darwin knew nothing about genes. Darwin talked about heredity. But once genes were discovered, then genes became the one and only mechanism of heredity for most people, including most professional evolutionists. So nowadays you say evolution and everyone thinks genes. What's happening very recently is we're pulling away from that and we're saying, wait a minute, let's go back to the concept of heredity and ask, are there other mechanisms of heredity other than genes? And there's a wonderful book called Evolution in Four Dimensions. Just remember that title, Evolution in Four Dimensions, and look it up on Amazon.com. And one mechanism of inheritance is the mechanism of symbolic thought. So all of a sudden, we're thinking about the kind of thing that Bloom said. And symbolic systems in general, which has mostly been like the province of postmodernists, right? Who are the most, most phobic about evolution. And we're saying that actually, and, and symbolic belief systems are something which is, there's something like genetics about it. This is how our behaviors are encoded and, and, it's, and, and expressed. And, and transmitted across generations. And at that point, metaphors takes on a status like genes. And you can begin to see why a work, work such as Hamlet, not to speak of a sacred text such as the Bible, can be so powerful because it is what is motivating behavior. And so this is like joining two ends of a continuum into a circle. Here's evolution, here's most of the thinking on symbolic thought, and all of a sudden, we're joining them into a, uh, a circle. And that means that the people who've been thinking about symbolic thought have a lot to contribute to core evolutionary theory. So part of what we're doing, and it's in that um, article, Evolving the Future, is we're actually, we've coined a new word, symbotype, which is like a genotype. And we're talking about a symbotype-phenotype relationship. And one of the insights of thinking this way 
is that what it means is in just the same way that you can have a, a genetic mutation, a single gene change that changes the phenotype, or you can be a genetic engineer and you can insert a gene and you can change the phenotype, you can do the same thing with a metaphor. And it makes it actually makes it sensible that you can implant a metaphor and you can change somebody's phenotype, sometimes in a transformational way. And it's a lot easier to implant a metaphor than it is to implant a gene. And that actually makes sense. It's why some of these, in some of these studies you can do an intervention that lasts an hour or three hours and it has this huge effect. So it's really interesting that we can accord the, the importance of narrative that Stora's colleagues have to go to, to expand evolution beyond this kind of gene-centric view which most of us, which most of us have. Do you have a, just following up on that, would you say what you call a single type is like a meme? A meme is fine, uh, yeah, so uh, of course, but now we get into word associations basically, and so a meme can mean many, um, many uh, things, and there's very much a legitimate uh, usage. Uh, what's not so legitimate is to think of culture in general as a bunch of isolated memes that are more or less out for themselves and not necessarily good for either people or individuals or groups. That is a theoretical possibility. It's possible for a new cultural trait to arise and spread simply on the basis of its transmittability without benefiting either individual humans or groups. That is theoretically possible and there's good examples. Okay? But they're not that common. And for the most part, what we have are systems of beliefs that work quite well for the groups that uh, have them. And Durkheim has a wonderful quote that says, at all times in history, human social life is only possible thanks to a vast symbolism. And so what we're doing, and what these folks are doing, and what we're doing when we confront something like a religious uh, system, is we're studying it as an integrated system of beliefs basically, which actually is very sophisticated and must be, because what does this belief have to do? It actually has to coordinate the activities of people in a very context-sensitive manner. Basically, it has to get people to act this way in this situation, that way in that situation, this way towards this group of people, that way towards that group of people. That's what it takes to, to be adapted to any environment, and that's what a culture does for you. So we need to we need to remind ourselves about the sophistication of these, of these uh, cultural systems. And that's why, again, the biological metaphor is, is, uh, is helpful, because it's basically leading us to expect that an enduring culture has to provide an anatomy, and a physiology, um, um, some, some kind of nervous system, replication machinery, expression machinery, all the stuff that we associate with, with genetic systems in some senses a culture has to provide. That's how adaptive it is at the, at the uh, group level. And that is a new way of thinking about culture, even though it has roots. I mean, Durkheim was kind of reaching for that. Uh, but that is, I think, very new against the, the landscape of current intellectual thought. Let me take one last question. So. Oh, okay. Well, I don't want to. I'm, not, I'm asking the second one, so I don't want to take away someone's only chance. Is there someone who is asking a question? Uh, sir? Just a quick uh, wondering out loud. It seems to me like this, you could treat science as a belief system, too. And that would have its own evolution and be in conflict in many cases with religion. So you could look at that conflict as a struggle or as a yeah, some sort of a struggle between Right, so science and religion, there's a lot written on that, and there's a book out by uh, Robert Macaulay called uh, Why Religion is Natural and Science is Not. <laughs> and <laughs> what? <laughs> well, what, what I'm saying to add about science, uh, science also leads to possible behaviors, quite often very, quote, profitable, okay? So then you can look at the different kinds of benefits you get, they are different in many ways, and then consider the possibility of somehow putting them together or doing 
anyway, treating science as a behavior system, as a belief system that produces beneficial Right, values. so one point of calling is, is that, is that, uh, is that science, when you look at it over the broad sweep of, of human history, is very uncommon and very fragile. And it's actually, when you go back to like hunter-gatherer and cultures and look at this, what is there that resembles science, there's very little. I mean, yes, I mean, anthropologists have said that every culture has a kind of a mode of thinking which is quasi-scientific and, and rational, and then they have other modes of thinking which we would associate with religion. But as far as institutions are concerned, and there's a difference between science and technology. So, of course, there's technological innovation in many cultures, but science, which is this kind of more abstract search for things without, doesn't necessarily have immediate utility, is something which is very recent and in some sense is very fragile. And that, that's, I think, a very interesting way of, of thinking about it. With respect to the relationship between science and, and religion, that's complex, and often, historically, it was a positive relationship. So in many ways, religion gave birth to science, in part because there was not a perceived conflict, basically because basically you can study God by studying his creation, and then only in cases of um, conflict did that, uh, uh, did that, did that become uh, problematic. And you know, I'll tell you, when you look at religions today, it's quite, quite curious. So if you look at the liberal religions, the mainstream liberal religions, what you find is, is that they're very open and modern and science-friendly, but they're very traditional in their practices. And then if you look at some of the more conservative recent religions, what you find is, is that they're very literalist and so on, but they're totally up to date with modern technology. And have even changed their form, their music, everything. They're just like way more up to date. And if anything is going to improve their, their practice, then they, they grab onto it. So it's a very interesting uh, and, and a complex, complex relationship. Okay. Thanks a lot.